my mic on. Now can you hear me? Good morning, good morning. It's a very good morning. Can you hear me? Ah, you can hear me back there. Good morning to you. I want to start off with a few announcements. I want to thank you for your financial giving. I, uh, we had a finance meeting um, last week, and it looks like God's doing some good stuff. People are giving, and we just really appreciate your giving online or in the box or uh, however you're doing it. We just want to thank you for that. We want to thank you for your special gifts, and we just want to lift up to the glory of God for that. I uh, also want to let you know that our senior youth will be going to CIY. Did I say that right? Yes. So if you know a senior youth that's interested in going, um, or you know someone who would like to go as a senior youth, and this is the first time they're starting to experience Christ, please see Noah. Uh, I know that he's got at least two or three, and he's interested in getting as many kids who want to experience a relationship with Jesus Christ to go with him. We'll also be doing a junior high one. He's checking into several of the things that are in the area or that are local for the junior hires. They don't like them to go out of state. This one actually is in Tennessee. Is that correct? Did I get that right? Yes. So, yes, they're going to have a good time. Uh, next, Bible studies. We have women's Bible study at 6, and I think y'all are still putting things back in the box, putting the pieces together. They're putting, still putting the pieces together. If you need to put the pieces together in your life, please see Debbie. Debbie, wave your hand. There's Debbie. She'd love to have you. Also, um, the men are at 615 doing a hybrid meeting. What does that mean? It means they're meeting in person. They'll be in the basic room and or they'll be online. So they'll be doing both and. And I'm not sure what you're studying now because y'all are in a change, right? Uh, done with Robert Morris, and they'll, well, not done with him, just not going to, yeah. <laughs> anyway, they'll, they're, they're, they're going to get another study, they're going to begin, so if you want to start at the beginning, this is the time to join them. That's at 715 in the basic room, if you want to come in person. If not, if you want to get online, wave your hand. Oh, did I say, set? yeah, right, 615, wave your hand. Okay, all right, if you need a link, because you're still afraid to gum out, uh, and these guys are kind of wild and crazy. So <laughs> get a hold of the Bubba and, and Dave, and they'll be able to get you a link. Uh, also, I want to let you know that Seedbed Daily, uh, Marsha, raise your hand. Uh, they're doing it online, and it is J.D. Walt, Seedbed De Devotional, and he does a great job with the scripture. So if you don't even want to join them, but you still want to do it, look up. Um, Seedbed Daily and get it on an app on your phone. Uh, if you don't, or if you're not tech savvy, some of you aren't tech savvy yet, we still have those that are paper trained like me. And it's right here. We have the upper room out here for you to dig into the word. Also, I want to give a praise offering to our leaders for starting Sunday school back. Uh, we had a whole bunch of kids. We had a lot of adults show up for both of the Sunday school classes. And I just want to encourage you next week, if you didn't go, to come on back. The Wesley class and the basic class, they're both meeting, and they want you to come and be a part of that. They're inviting you to come and be a part of that. Uh, confirmation class, we're looking at doing confirmation class. If you know someone who's in junior high or a high schooler who is interested, please see me. We're trying to look for the best time to do that and to get that running according with sports and all the other crazy stuff that kids are doing now. Um, and then my last announcement is I want to give God a praise offering because our field hockey team, the Islanders, won the state championship. And we have two, kid, two of the girls in our church, Brooke uh, and Jordan, who were on that team, and God did a good thing. Those are all the announcements I have. Paul's got one. All right, Paul, what's your announcement, honey? Can you? Can I hear you? Uh, Noah. Noah might have a mic. Do you have a mic there, Mike? Noah. Grab, grab that mic right there. Oh, there you go. What number? Twelve. Twelve. There you go. Okay. Well, um, so uh, as many of you, uh, some of y'all may know, I'm the uh, chairman of the staff parish here at uh, Trinity, and. Uh, so we send our recommendation every year to
to uh, either keep or basically just keep or try to get a new pastor or whatever. And um, so we sent our recommendation in, and of course the district makes the final decision. And so the bishop makes the final decision. So they made the final decision, and uh, Trish will be coming back another year. So. Uh, If she wants to. <laughs> I already checked the yes box. I can't back out now. <laughs> no. Okay, well, thank you so much then. Thank you, Paul. Now, I invite you to center yourself as we focus on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, as we have our prelude.
I invite you to stand and join me in our call to worship. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne the living creatures and the elders and the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Therefore, let us worship the Lamb. Amen. Father God, we come today to worship you. We come today as those who know not only is our earth beautiful because of your blessings upon it? But we are your people. We are the sheep of your pasture. And we come to you as we look in this new revelation, the understanding of who you are and whose we are. We ask that you would be with us as we sing praise to your holy name. And all the people say amen. Our opening hymn of praise is all hail the power of Jesus' name. <laughs> All the people say amen. Please remain standing as we affirm our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Our special this morning comes from the George W. Amos Men's Chorus. Thank you.
Amen. It was good to finally have them get back together, and uh, Miss Harriet did reveal that they acted the same way a bunch of schoolboys. So <laughs> just to let you know, it was a good thing to have them back. We are starting to, because the governor has released some things and people are getting their COVID shots, we're starting to do some of the things that we hadn't done before. Uh, we will be having grief group tomorrow at my house. We are doing choirs. We are doing uh, things like the kids are starting to get back together. Uh, we're going to be doing VBS. Those things are starting to go back to normal. Can I have an amen? Thank you, Jesus. Woo! All right. We have been journeying through the Bible, and we have finally gotten to the place where we are at the last book of the Bible, and the last book of the Bible is Revelation, because it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's no S on it, just so that you know. Um, and it is a book that speaks about the coming of, of the end times but the focus isn't really on that the focus is actually on jesus and what jesus does so it's also known as the re revelation of jesus so it's the revelation he gives it's the revelation that he is and it's the revelation that we get to see in the end because he is the what the victory the victory so we're going to enjoy that all right our scripture today comes from revelation Chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Let's read that together aloud. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand. And they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh, Father God, we come today as those who are hungry, hungry to know the revelation of who you are hungry to know what our future holds, and hungry to have a world of peace. There has been so much chaos and craziness in our world, and, and, and we long for that. We long for the peace that you can bring. And I ask, Lord, that today you would grant us that peace. I also pray, Father, that today you would open our minds and ears by the power of your Spirit, that we might better understand not only your plan through Jesus, 
but also your plan for our lives, that we might truly be those priests and servants that you call us to be, that we might understand that worthy is the Lamb and that he has saved us and that he loves us. Be with us today as we delve deeply in your word and we worship and praise you today. In Jesus' name, I pray. And all the people say, Amen. I just want to let you know before I begin that there are several people who have asked that I print out extra copies. They are out in the commons if you would like a hard copy and if that would help you um, to go home and review it again. Uh, also, we left last week with uh, just reading uh, a small skippet of a snippet of uh, chapter one, and I gave you homework. Your homework was to read chapter two and three. Did anybody do that? Okay, I got one person. Okay, all the rest of you fail. Okay, so that means I, instead of te- preaching this, I got, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> anyway, so I want you to pay attention. Remember, I told you in the very beginning that this is going to be engaging your brains. You can't just sit there and, and pretend like you're not receiving because I will ask questions throughout and you have to answer. And if you get them wrong, then I have to start back at the beginning again. I don't know about you, but at the last presidential election, um, I think I was struggling. I know that I align with what God's plan is. And so a lot of times when we get to those presidential elections, sometimes it's hard to choose a good president that's going to be running our country. And I think I found myself struggling. Which one would be worthy? Which one would line up with what needed to be done? And as I looked at the candidates, I began to examine some of their failings and shortcomings, and I found myself realizing that there wasn't anybody worthy. Can I have an amen? And so there I was struggling to figure out, could I put confidence in one man or the other? And who was going to hold this high office that might order the U.S. of A. and order our world and possibly bring war or peace? Um, And I found myself saying that maybe there is no one worthy, no one worthy. And I'm here to tell you that that may be true, it may not be true, and we don't know who the next president of the United States is going to be, but there's one thing we do know. Even though we don't know what tomorrow holds, we do know who holds tomorrow. And it doesn't matter really who the president of the United States is because God has already done the plan. So we need to trust in the one who has a higher office. And that higher office is Jesus Christ. We need to trust in the one that holds tomorrow and is worthy to hold our lives and the entire course of history. But who is that? Who is worthy of that kind of awesome responsibility? Who is worthy of that honor? Who is worthy of our trust? Who can we be confident that even as things are unfolding not for the good, in the tomorrows will make things right? Is there anyone we can trust? Is there anyone who can be the answer? Yes, there is. And today, we get to look at that one who is. Today, we get to look at Jesus, for worthy is the lamb that was slain. Worthy is the one who claims all names. It is in that place that we find ourselves. But before we go, there's a few people who were not here last week, so I want to back up and give a quick review. We are looking at the book of Revelation, the revelation of Christ. So if you were not here last week, I want you to go back and I want you to read 1, 1 2, and 3 and four, I'm going to give you a quick overview of four so that you can catch up. And if you weren't here last week, you might want to get a hard copy out here so that you can catch up with chapter one, I mean chapter one, and you'll have to read what, two, and three yourself, right? But if you've got questions, I can answer your questions, but we don't have time. We've only got seven weeks to cover this, so that's where we are. So before we go there, I want to give you a quick review so everyone will be up to speed. Last week, we looked at a vision that John received on a Sabbath day, which was not Sabbath day, the Lord's day, which is Sunday, and he was in the Spirit. Does anybody know what it means to be in the Spirit? I see somebody over there shaking their head. I see another person shaking their head. Who doesn't know what it means to be in the Spirit? Does anybody want to know what it means to be in the Spirit? 
Okay, I have one person that says yes. Everybody else doesn't care. <laughs> Told you I was going to ask you questions. I was going to ask you, what does it mean to be in the Spirit? What it means to be in the Spirit is that you're in a state of prayer, and God is speaking to you, and God can speak to you many different ways. He can speak to you through nature. You ever walked and you hear that still, small voice, and you know God wants you to, I got some good, good, good examples of that. There's other times when you are praying about an outcome and God leads you in one direction and you know you got to go that way, right? There's another time when God speaks to you in visions. And this is going to be one of those times when God's speaking to them in visions. There's another time when you're reading the scripture and God says, do you got it? Okay? And it's the answer that you need. So this particular time, John is in the spirit. It's on the Lord's day and he sees a vision of glorified Jesus and is told what to do. He's told to write down what God speaks to him. And basically, it's a letter for seven churches. Each church gets their own letter, and he writes it down, and he tells the churches what they need to do in order to be faithful and in order to miss the judgment. Those who have ears, let them hear. That's why I wanted you to read two and three, because I want you to have ears to hear. Can I have an amen? All right, so... And then, in our text today, he finds himself again in the Spirit. We know what the Spirit is, right? He's there, and he's having an encounter with God, and in this next vision, he sees the door or the portal of heaven open. It's not the only place we see that in the Scriptures. There's other places where we see that in the Scripture, where the portal of heaven is open. And when he, it is open, he is taken up into the throne room of God. And we see this in chapter 4, and he is there and he's seeing a picture of the royal throne room of God, and Father God is sitting on the throne. Now, the throne room is magnificent, and it's surrounded by what we would all say almost like glass. Cornelian, this almost looks like glass. It is a perfect reflection of Father God. So, if you, anybody ever been to Crater Lake? If you've, ever, if you've ever been to Crater Lake, you know what I'm talking about. Because the water is so smooth that you can see the perfect reflection of the mountain that's there. So it's looking, it's a perfect reflection of Father God. And he wants you to know that you are in a place of worship. So you're in that place, and around the throne are four living creatures. One looks like a lion, one looks like an ox, one like a man, and one like a flying eagle. And each has six wings, and they're covered with eyes. I don't know about you, but that might be a little scary. That's not the only place in the scripture we see that either. Can anybody tell me where that is also seen in another scripture? I'll give you a hint. It's a prophet. Anybody know? Now, all the bell people know, because I told you earlier, they're not speaking. They know the answer. Ezekiel. There you go. And it's in that that they begin to see these exalted angels. These are exalted angels. And they are the guards around the throne of God. They are the guards, and that's why they're closest to the throne. And then we see the 24 elders who are there to rule with the Lord. And they're in the next circle. So what you see is Father God there. You see these four living creatures, and you see the elders. All right. They are there to worship and ceaselessly proclaim the holiness of God. Then we move to chapter 5. In chapter 5, we see Father God on the throne, and soon we're going to see the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And in Father God's hand, on the right hand, he is holding a scroll. Our story begins at this place, and this is what we're going to be studying today. He sees in his right hand, John does, that he's holding this scroll, and on the scroll, it's written on both sides, and it has on seven seals. Now, stop a minute. Does anybody remember from last week, what does the right hand stand for? Right hand of God. Say what? The authority and power. Thank you, Preacher Carol. <laughs> authority and power. That's why Jesus sits at the right hand of God the Father. And he will come to what? Judge... The quick, does anybody know what the quick is? 
the ones that are alive and the dead, those that have already, if they haven't claimed the resurrection, their spirit's there, we talked about that a while back, and their bodies being in a place until the resurrection happens, okay? So, so he comes to judge the quick and the dead. We have, we have God, Father God sitting there with a scroll in his hands. They didn't have books during this time. They had scrolls. So we understand that. And these were papyrus rolls that were used for public and private documents. Now, the papyrus reed was pressed out with pieces probably about this wide. And what they do is they would connect them together, and then they would put them on a ro wooden rod on the top and a wooden rod on the bottom, and they would roll them up. And they would unroll the scroll and roll up the bottom as they would read it. You've probably seen that in a movie, right? Where they're doing announcements or whatever. So that's what it looks like. That's what he has. He, he has that. And what you need to know is that usually the writing on these were only on one side, and they were on those vertical columns that you see. All right. When it's written on both sides, it's called an opithograph. Opithograph. And this opithograph, because it's on two sides, we know that it is a private document. The public will only be on one side. Very, very rarely would a private, a unprivate document be written on both sides, unless you were really, really poor. So it's in this place that we know that this is a private document, not for sale. We also know it has seven seals on it. Now they would seal these scrolls. They would roll them up like this. They would put a piece of rope around them. Then they would each person that was witnessing. This particular document, they didn't have notary publics. They would actually put a seal right over the knot. And each person had their own seal. Each person had their own place, their own seal, their special seal that they would put on that. Um, in Roman days, in the law, when they did a will, you'd have to have how many witnesses do you think? Seven witnesses. Why? Because that made it complete. That made it complete. So they had to have seven witnesses, and, and they were the only ones who could break the seal or their legal representatives in order for that document to be open. The scroll was sealed, and to make quite certain that no unauthorized person could possibly open it, it was sealed with the seven seals, making it a complete seal. The importance of this vision, then, is not so much what is there, but who can open it. Once again, this is a revelation of who? Jesus. So we're going to see what Jesus can do. And that's what we see all through Revelation. All right. So he is the one who can open it. We find out later he is not only the one, he is the only one who is worthy and has the authority to open the seals and disclose the scroll's contents. Since the seals hinder the opening, they cannot be broken until God's time. You know, again and again in Scripture we hear, we don't know the day or the time. Only God knows the right time. So this is a document that John has been given or a revealed to him that's going to happen in a future time. So he's kind of given a sneak preview. This hasn't happened yet, but it's going to happen. So be ready, all right? So this is what we see. We also see that, that in this place there are seven, seven seals on this scroll, and we know that this is including the things that are going to happen in the end. We know that it's going to unfold the mysteries of the culmination of things to come, the goal or end of history for both the conquerors, who are the conquerors? Who are going to be the conquerors at the end of? The Christians, the saints. Can you raise your hand? You know Jesus, right? He's your personal Lord and Savior, right? Okay, so you're going to be a conqueror. Or those who worship the beast who won't be the conquerors because they're going to be cast down into the pit, okay? This, thus, on the scroll, this is God's last will and testament. So what is being sealed here is what God's last will is going to be. However, it's not a deed or title, but unlike the deeds and title today, this one didn't necessarily talk about what was going to be inherited. It's not talking about what we're going to get. It's talking about what's going to happen when the one who rightfully owns the earth, and that is who? Jesus. 
reclaims it. So that's what it's talking about. While the scroll will include a message of doom and judgment, it's also going to include redemption and how the world will be redeemed from Satan. And those who have followed him will not be redeemed, but those who have followed Jesus will be redeemed. All right. So he saw a mighty angel after he saw the Lord sitting on, Father God sitting on the throne. And a mighty angel began to proclaim with a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth, those that had already died, could open the scroll or even look inside. And John begins to weep. Now, this angel announces this all throughout the world. And there was not one worthy to open the scrolls. So because John was so upset about this, he began to weep. I, I always heard, this is the only place that I've ever seen this, I've always heard that there are no tears in heaven. Have you heard that? But this is a contrast to that because he is weeping because of two things, I believe. I think the first thing is because he's frustrated, because he had already been promised back in Revelation 4 that God would show him what was going to take place. Have you ever gone to some place and they said, oh, well, you get to do such and such, and then you get there and you don't get it? He's frustrated because he wanted to see what was going to take place. And he's thinking maybe the future will be denied, right? And I think the second reason is it seems that there is no one in the universe to whom the mysteries can be revealed. And he's thinking now the culmination of history would indefinitely be postponed. I want you to think about that for a minute. Let's say we had to live in the sin and deprivation of our world forever. And we didn't know of anything that was going to come. There was no promise that there's someone that holds tomorrow. I can understand why he was upset. Because I don't know about you, but I want to know that I got a promise tomorrow. Can I have an amen? So it's in this place that we find this thing going on in his heart. But he knew that God could not deliver a message to mankind unless they were fit and ready to receive it. He also knew that just like a teacher, the truth could not come if the students are not willing and available to receive it. Just like a preacher can preach their heart's content. But if the people do not have ears that hear, then it ain't going to get there. It is in this place that God cannot deliver a message to mankind unless they're fit to receive it. How do we get fit to receive a message from God? We repent. And we open our heart because who interprets the word of God for us? Holy Spirit. And we've already talked about those things. So we know that if we repent, we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we allow that to wash clean, and the Spirit comes and resides in us, we are fit to receive his word. But we have to be those who pray, listen, and obey, because the more we don't do that, the further away we get from God. So it's in that place that we begin to see that they needed to be rightfully fit. And so the problem is, is that in every generation, God has got a word, but it's the generation willing to receive. I think our generations are getting more and more like the word of God says that they're just looking for something to tickle their ears. They're not looking for the truth. And because of that, we see more and more people falling away. Um, so the message cannot be d delivered until there are those that are found who are willing and capable to receive it. And there is a great need, I think, in our world today for people who are willing to soften their hearts so that they can receive the message of God. John is in this state, he's weeping, he feels as if he's losing ground, and then all of a sudden one of the elders begins to speak. He says, don't weep. Don't weep. See, the Lion of Judah, the Root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. John's sorrow is quickly brought to an end as one of the elders announces that there is one that has triumphed over death. One who has overcome, one who has conquered. And this is when we get to see Christ again. For he is the one who has overcome death, the powers of evil, and has won the victory. Right? He is the one that is Messiah. And we then see those two great titles, 
the tribe of Judah and the root of David. Those are both what we call Old Testament messianic titles that represent that Jesus is the conquering Messiah. He is the son of David. He is the son of God. He is the promised Messiah that is to come. Then John saw, instead of the Lion of Judah, a lamb. It says, Then John saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four elders, I mean the four creatures, and the 24 elders. And this lamb had seven horns, seven eyes, which are the spirits that are the sevenfold spirit of God, and they were sent out to the earth. Here is the supreme moment of the vision. Christ, in his victory, has arrived at the throne room of God. This is the scene that all of creation has been waiting for. These creatures are beginning to form this circle that becomes ever wider. And, of course, Jesus is right in the middle. John looks and expects to see that almighty lion but instead he sees a lamb that looks as if it's been slaughtered. This new figure portrays Jesus Christ and his sacrificial death. This links the Messiah to the Old Testament Passover lamb. Remember about the Passover and the blood that's on the lentils? It is the access to the throne of heaven. And it is that thing that we understand as the suffering servant of Isaiah. Noah did a great sermon on sunrise service about the suffering servant. The lamb's metaphor will dominate the rest of this book of Revelation. We will see it for at least 39 times. And we will see it over and over again because the lamb is what? The one who has died, right? He is the lamb of God who takes away sins of the world. That's right. Okay, this lamb is also a ruler. How do we know that? Does anybody know why? He has seven what? Seven horns. Horns are a sign of power. And they're also, seven is completeness. So this is the complete picture of God's power. The paradox is we have this wounded lamb standing there with seven horns and seven eyes. And yet, it is the might and power of God that can shatter any of the enemies. Let God arise and his enemies be shattered. You know that song? Let God, let God arise. This is what it's talking about. The lamb also has seven eyes, which are the spirits that go out. All right, the first one is the omnipotence. Big word, omni, means all potent, all powerful. Say that word, omnipotent. That's the horns. And then there's the omniscience. Anybody know what that means? Knows it all, sees it all. Did you know God knows and sees everything you do? Lord have mercy, right? Yep, he does, even though you don't want to think about that. There is no place on earth where his watchful eye cannot be. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he's watching me. Great song. This is a tremendous picture of Christ. It's the fulfillment of the hopes of the dreams of Israel. He not only is the Lion of Judah and the Root of David, he is the sacrificial lamb that has availeth for all, and he has set us free. He is the one that is omnipotent. He is omniscient. He is all that we need. He is the all and all, and he is the one who still bears the mark. It says in Isaiah that he has the marks in his hands. Our name is written on that mark. That means you have been claimed by and named by him. Truly is this lamb that was slain. Can I have an amen? Now Jesus is the only one. He went to the one who was sitting on the throne who is Father God and he takes the scroll. No other created being no other person in heaven can take this but the Lamb. Christ's rank and character and ability allows him not only to take that scroll, but to open it and thus tell what the destiny of all creation is, you and me and all creation. And as soon as he grabs this scroll, there is pandemonium, and everything goes crazy because it is as if Jesus had walked in here 
and everybody can't help but praise him. And it's in this place that we see the immediate response of Jesus' presence of praise. They want to fall down on their face. They want to worship him. They want to praise him because he is the one. And the interesting thing, the rest of this scripture is three songs of praise, right? Three songs of praise, not one, not two, but three songs of praise representing the Trinity and Almighty God. So this first one is done by the living creatures, the four living creatures and the 24 elders. The second one is done by them, and then there's an angelic host. And then it is not only the four living creatures and the 24 elders and the angelic host, it's all of creation. So what we're seeing is a picture of ever-increasing praise for Almighty God. Now, why is that true? Because this is the culmination of all history. Here is the truth. The heaven and earth and all that's within them has been created and designed to do what? Praise God. That's why you, you are created to give God the glory. If you died tomorrow and you never praised God, would you be, if you, even if you were a billionaire, would you have fulfilled your purpose? Mm -mm. Because your purpose on earth is to praise God, to worship and praise him. You are to have no other gods before him. You are to keep the Sabbath day holy. And you are to worship him. That's your whole existence. We sure mess that up a lot, don't we? Can I have an amen? <laughs> amen. It's our privilege to lend our voices to this heavenly chorus and our lives to this so that the chorus, you know, can be reigning all over the earth. That's one of the reasons why we sing hymns. That's one of the reasons why we sing praise choruses. And, you know, and if even one of you who has claimed Christ as their Savior is not singing in a chorus, then that chorus is incomplete. That chorus is incomplete. So, and the first version of praise, they all fall down before the Lamb, uh, the one on the throne, and this acknowledges that Jesus is divine or his deity. All right, and this is what they call a new song. Now, why would this be a new song? They're always praising God up in heaven. Why is this a new song? Think about that just a minute. Any ideas? No ideas? Because this is the inauguration of Jesus as he comes and sits down at the right hand of God the Father. This is the inauguration. This is when they're bringing him in as ruler, okay? That's never happened before, right? It's only after the ascension that that happens. So it's in this place that we see that. And the second reason is because, um, the second reason it's a new song is because, let's see if I can find where I was, I got, I got sidetracked there, um, is because it is a place where the incense are falling. That's not it. Anyway, I'll come back to it. I'm going to go back to where I was. So this is the new song. They have, they, as they fall down, they had two things in their hands. Can anybody remember what they were? Bowls of incense, and that's the prayers of the people. If you've ever been to a Catholic church, they have these little things, and they swing the incense. That's supposed to be the prayers of the people. Well, it says when you praise God or you pray to God, it's collected into heaven, and it's burned at the altar. So that's one of the bowls. So I think there's two reasons why we see this. One is it's representing the saints who are giving prayers of petition. Now, does anybody know what the difference between a petition and a prayer of praise is? Anybody know? What's a petition? You're asking God for something, right? God, would you please, can you help me with, will you do? How many of us pray like that? Oh, yeah, all the time. What's a prayer of praise? Praise him for who he is. Thank him for what he's already done, right? So what this is saying is that we believe that John is mentioning this as a, the saints petitioning God. So why would, in this scene, would there be people petitioning God? Because there are martyrs in heaven. And the martyrs are below the altar, and we're going to see that in one of the revealing of the seals. And they are there until time has happened and they can be released. So they're petitioning God. They're asking God to bring forth his judgment to those who have killed them. 
In Revelation 8, 3 and 4, the prayer of the saints are immediately connected with the blowing of the trumpets. The blowing of the trumpets is bringing that judgment. We're going to learn more about that next week. These prayers are petitions for God to judge the world and to extend the kingdom throughout the earth. The second type of prayer are the prayers of the believers of all ages. Scripture associates that with the burning of the prayers of the saints. That's giving God the praise. It's giving him thanks. We know that the angels, the four elder, I mean the 24 elders, and the, those that are around the throne are already doing that. So it's also that. Here we see God's people being referred to saints. Now, are you a saint? Who says yes? Raise your hand. Who doesn't know? Who wants to know? Don't, well, it has nothing to do with feelings. The word is hagios. Hagios. Say that word with me. Hagios. And it means basically that you've been set aside or consecrated for God's service that you are to be reserved for God's praise, in other words, to praise God, and to be holy and sanctified. This is referring to people who believe in Jesus Christ. It's referring to loyal followers, the holy ones, the saints. Now, are all the saints perfect? Are any of them perfect? No, we're pressing on to perfection, right? Okay, but what it means is that it doesn't matter how you feel, it matters what Jesus does. Once again, remember, this is the revelation of who? Jesus Christ. And so if we begin to understand that, he claims us as we accept that salvation. And we are called to be those who are holy and dedicated to God himself. Remember, saints are simply normal disciples and believers who are set apart for God purposes. I want you to turn to somebody and I want you to call them a saint this morning. Did she do it this time? <laughs> Can I tell? In the first service, Linda looked... Linda... <laughs> I don't know if I can say this. Susan, why did I say Linda? Because Linda's sitting in there. Susan looked right at Tim and she started laughing. She couldn't tell him he was a saint. So anyway, there, I did it again. See, you can tell I'm not a saint. I'm not perfect either. Here you go. All right, so it's at this place that we know that we have been claimed and named as the saints of God. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God, raise your hand, persons of every tribe, language, people, and nation. It's right there. It's in the Word. Okay? And you have made them a kingdom and priest to serve God. There's that, what we were just talking about, saints. Those have been set apart. And they will reign on earth. Now, we need to look at this kind of as what we would call the eschatological kingdom talking about what will come to be. This new song is one like's never been said before. We see it as the inauguration of Jesus. I found my notes. There you go. And we see it as one that is going to execu execute its kingdom and promises as an awesome event that leads up to the end of the world. If we understand that this is only happening through the direct death of the human, fully human Christ, who has now redeemed and purchased all humanity. Remember, the revelation isn't about what's going to happen. It's about the one who will make it happen and what he does. So remember, we always got to keep our eye on that understanding of that it's all about Christ. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. So think about that. It's all about Jesus. Then I looked and I heard a voice of many angels. We have Jesus. We have the four glorified angels. We have the 24. And then the angels are being added to it. And he sees thousands upon thousands, 10,000 times 10,000 angels surrounding the throne. This is a similar vision to what we see in Daniel as they are worshiping the ancient of days. 
the imagery suggests the infinite honor and power of the one who's in the center. It is a seven-fold ring of a bell as they list what and who Christ is. They say he is the one who has power, wealth, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and praise. That shows that he is the complete one that we are to worship. Once again, the emphasis is on the praise of Christ, his death, and his perfect redemption. He is worthy to receive recognition because of his power, the spiritual and material wealth that he possesses, the, the, because he is worthy, perfect in wisdom, omniscient, say omniscient, omnipotent, say omnipotent, all-knowing, all-powerful, honor, glory, and the one who will bring the blessing. Finally, we hear a third song. I didn't read this on purpose because I want you to hear it fresh. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne, who is that? Father God, Father God, and the Lamb, Jesus, be praise, honor, and glory, and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. Amen. Do it with me. Amen. And they bowed down before the throne. Now, what is happening here is the beginning of the culmination of the future of the world. They are saying, Amen, which means so be it. Bring it on, God. Have you ever said, beam me up, God, there's no intelligible life here on earth? Bring it on, God. So that's what we're seeing. What we see here is all creation had been waiting for Jesus to take back what was rightfully his, to take back the earth, to take back those who have been saved, and to free them from the bondage of corruption. As Jesus takes the scroll, the title deed to earth and creation, everybody erupts in praise because they know something new is going to happen. And it's going to be the redeeming and the regaining of paradise. Once again, there will be no more sorrow. There will be no more grief. And all will be healed. And all the people are saying, bring it on, God. I'm ready. I'm ready. So now the throne room is set. The lamb has received the scroll. Judgment and mercy is going to be coming. And we're going to find out what that's about next week. Are you ready? Okay. All right, so we're going to, we're going to dig into that. Everything has been ready for the lamb to take back what rightfully belongs to him. But I have a question before you, we close this today. My question is this, is where will you be on that day? Are you ready if today is the day? Do you know the one, the only one, who is worthy and can save your life? Have you received that gift of salvation? If you have not, I'm going to invite you to pray with me today. If you have, I'm going to ask you to ask him to restore that part of your life and bring you back in line with where he is. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, I thank you so much that you are a God who loves us so much that you sent your only son. The lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, that takes away our sins. Now it says in Psalm 139 that you have a plan for our lives before one of them comes to be. And today I believe there is at least one person here who wants to order their life according to your plan. I ask that you would come in and that you would wipe away their sins that the blood of Jesus would come and you'd put in order their life and they would accept you as their personal Lord and Savior. I pray that they would receive that atonement and Lord, that they would allow your Holy Spirit to come and you would fit them right for your kingdom. Because Lord, I don't want one, not even one who are here, 
not to know the victory that comes for those who follow you. And I pray this all in the holy name of Jesus that makes it possible. And all the people say, Amen and Amen. All right. It's time for us to go to the Lord in prayer again. But this time we're going to be talking a little bit about those who we know in our, our current purview. God calls us to be intercessors. That's what we talked about, those prayers, um, those petitions before God, and we're going to lift up our petitions. Uh, I want you to let you know that Gloria Trice has COVID. Uh, she wants to thank you for those who have been reaching out to her. We announced that last week. And she wants to thank those who've been dropping off food, those who have sent flowers. She said somebody sent her flowers the other day and there was no card on it. She wants to know who gave it. I said, well, it's supposed to be a agape gift. You're not supposed to know. So uh, she just wants to thank whoever it was. Greg Gardy had surgery on Friday and his throat is healing. So please be with them. Walter Forrest is having surgery on Wednesday. Please lift them up. Uh, Beverly Gillikin lost Alex. Please be with her in her grief. Uh, Wayne Wilson is still healing from his back surgery. Now, there might be others that you know that need those healing touches. We want to go to the Lord and lift them up. Father God, we just thank you for the wonderful privilege of being able to come to you and to lay our petitions down before your throne. I ask, Father, that today you would be with those I've already mentioned and that you would be with those in our community who are struggling with other things. I pray for those who are struggling in relationships or illnesses or some of the family situations that I know about in our church. I pray, Lord, that you would be with them and help them and that you would heal them. I also ask, Lord, that you would hear the prayers of your people as we are called to intercede for those we love. Hear this, the prayers of your people. Father, we thank you for the victories that we have seen. We thank you for the healings that are coming. We thank you that joy is just back home again. We thank you that the Islanders won state champion. We thank you that the volleyball girls, they won a regionals. We thank you that you are giving us victory after victory and that you are touching us and eradicating this COVID. We ask, Lord, that you would continue to be with us as we go forward, we pray for our military. We pray for peace in our nations. We pray for our government. We pray for our president. We pray that your Holy Spirit would fall on all those on the front line and all those in power and that they would listen to your voice and be obedient, that they would follow your ways. And we pray this all in the holy name of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And all the people say, Amen. Our closing song is one that you know well. And it's what we're going to do. We're going to lay down our crowns and we're going to crown him Lord of Lords. Would you please stand and let us sing.
want you to do something special today and each day in this week. I want you to at least one time a day give praise to God and ask him to come in and allow your life to be a praise offering to him. Try to do that every day this week because as you do, you're going to begin to realize that you have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and that your life is supposed to sing praise to him. Go forth in his glorious name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all the people say amen. Please be seated. we got a wonderful postlude. The bells are going to be ringing for us. the day that the Lord has made. Go forth and rejoice in it. Get out of here. <laughs> 